content um, and it would be a shame to miss out. Um, we look forward to finding uh, more about you and your businesses. We are a very Reading centric biz um, business networking group and we have no shame in saying that. Now this morning, we're talking about the property industry and for those uh, who have come specifically to see Phil Brown, my absolute apologies. He sends his apologies. There was a date clash right at the end that we uh, couldn't get out of. He will be speaking at a later date, but I have um, three fabulous speakers for you today. We have Martin Ebbs, we have uh, Trina, and I'm starting off with a, a good friend of mine, an inspirational speaker and a business leader, and that would be Ben G, who I met uh, a couple of years ago at the end of COVID, who then set up his first uh, estate agency in Wokingham. And you are, and Ben, you're about to open which, how many now? Uh, so we're just, uh, morning everybody. Thank you for inviting me on, Phil. Um, we're just about to open our fifth branch um, in two and a half years. So it's been a, a busy couple of years for us. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Ben. Please tell us about a hat and home and uh, how you're seeing the property market these days. Thank you, sir. Great, thank you. Um, morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Ben, as Phil's kind introduced me. Um, we, um, I run a business called Hat and Home. We're a five branch estate agency and lettings agency business um, based around the Reading area. Um, I also um, opened a um, finance business, so a mortgage and protection brokerage last year called Milliner Financial Services. Um, the property market is is never out of um, the news, um, and it certainly uh, interests most of the population, um, uh, and clearly everybody on this call today. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about property on a national level, then bring it back down to a local level, talk to you a bit about what we are experiencing in the market and what we expect to come, if that's okay. Um, so let's start with a high level um, look at what, what we're trying to do in the housing market. The government have a target of trying to build 300,000 new homes per year. And it's widely reported um, that we're not managing that. Um, an average over the last um, three years, uh, sorry, 10 years is that we're building 178,000 a year, which is falling well short of the target. It's getting better. So 2021 to 2022, we managed to build two, 232,000. So we're getting closer to target. What's really interesting is what Reading are doing in terms of new builds. Um, so uh, last last year, um, so the last three years, Reading have built 2,080 new homes um, as a borough, uh, and that's against the target of 1,598. So Reading are absolutely smashing it and bucking the trend in terms of new build, um, which is really encouraging because it says a lot about the infrastructure, it says a lot about the investment in the area, and it says a lot about how attractive it is to not only the end user, but developers and investors that are coming into the area. Um, just having a little whistle stop tour of the last three years, which um, have been a bit of a roller coaster for the property market. I think from a very high level perspective, we obviously had COVID in 2020. Um, everybody had to stay at home um, and that, that caused some challenges for people. Um, and I think that the challenges that we were faced with were twofold. How do we work and how do we work differently going forward? and also the relationships we have with the people that we live with. Um, and from a property perspective, we saw um, pressures um, from both of those um, uh, angles, really. Um, you know, we, we saw more people having to work from home forced into it. And we've seen obviously widely reported um, changes that are long term now in terms of people working remotely and, and semi-remotely in hybrid roles. But also we saw an awful lot of people change their personal situation during COVID where they they realized they didn't quite like as the people they were living with as much as they thought they did full time and, and things things changed. And it was quite dramatic actually, um, some of the changes we saw in that realm. So, so what happened when we came out of COVID in 2021, which is when I started the business, is that it seemed like everybody and their dog was moving. Um, the, the people that needed needed a garden were moving for a garden the people that needed an extra bedroom were moving for an extra bedroom the people that were splitting up getting together whatever it may be everybody was moving and the property market went crazy um very unexpectedly actually uh, there was a huge demand on what was very little stock available and prices soared um that's no surprise um to anybody in this call i'm absolutely certain of it um 
we, we saw that continue um, for a significant um, period of time. And um, prices were rising double digits year for the, for the year, 18 months that we saw that happen. Um, all good things come to an end. Um, Liz Trust saw to that in October 22, when the mini budget came out and, and essentially changed everything in a very short period of time. And, and the, obviously the biggest thing we saw there was the change in, in interest rates, um, which had downward pressure on people's finances. And that changed very, very quickly. So we, we, we found that we were in an interest rate environment of, of artificially lows for 10 years, for a decade. Um, but for all of us who, who remember that they, it was an artificially low period and, and say, well, you know, you know, we were lucky to have that. We were lucky to get those interest rates. There was effectively a whole generation of house buyers who knew no different. And that's a seismic change when you're suddenly faced with um, a mortgage that is going to shut you an awful lot more than course it was going to be. And, um, and potentially means that you can't buy what you thought you were going to be, uh, buy. So that was a significant change in the property market. And since then, for the last year, we've seen um, a shift from a seller's market into a buyer's market. Um, in terms of those interest rates, just to give you a bit of an idea, and I, I think this is quite interesting, the average base rate, the average Bank of England base rate over the last 50 years is 9%, believe it or not. So probably a lot higher than we all think. Since 1989, the average rate is 5.25%, which is currently where the base rate sits at the moment. This is a normal environment. We just need to get used to it being normal again and, and realize that actually these are probably more healthy and sustainable levels to be lending money at. Um, but as I say, when you've got a generation of people who, who have been used to paying, you know, one and a half, two percent fixed rate mortgages, um, that obviously comes as quite a shock. Um, one of the problems that obviously comes to that is people coming out of those fixed rate mortgages. And I know we've got a couple of finance brokers on, on the call today who will be acutely aware of what that means to people's finance. Um, there was huge pressure on coming out of fixed rates and, and it costing hundreds and hundreds of pounds extra on people's mortgages um, per month. So then affordability becomes a problem and people then look to move, downsize, um, tighten their belts, um, and, and, and it, it caused a bit of a ripple um, that, that we've had to deal with very quickly because everything seems to happen very quickly at the moment. Um, so that's what's happened in the last three years. Um, currently, what we're seeing um, is um, prices are about 8% lower than they were in September last year, 8 to 10% lower. Um, that includes the Reading area, but they're 22% higher than they were in December 2019. So whilst there might be some people caught in, in, um, in having a property that was worth a little bit less than they bought it for, that's only if you bought last year and you're moving now, which is very rare for people. Um, you know, it's ebbs and flows, peaks and troughs. We all know what happens in the property market. And over time, it continues to rise and it will continue to rise over time. Um, the property market is built on sentiment and supply and demand and how people feel and what the press are saying. Um, and, and, you know, those three things that affect it, supply, demand, the cost of finance are all absolutely intertwined. So what we're seeing now is um, we're seeing the demand is still strong, but not as strong as it was. And the supply is, um, is uh, increasing. And that has downward pressure on pricing. People have more choice. People are more cautious. People don't make decisions quite as quickly about compromising um, on the property they might have compromised on a year ago. So something with a smaller garden, one less bedroom, something needing more work to do. They'll just hold tight. Um, on average, it takes 13 viewings to sell a property at the moment. Um, it was six viewings a year ago. OK, so that, that's quite significant. Um, and that's purely because people just taking their time. They want to find the right type of property. Now, as an estate agency, it's our job to make sure that people um, uh, are, I guess, compromise on what they're looking for, that they, they, they realize that sometimes what they think is um, not the best property for them is actually the best that's available in the market. That's our job as agents. And then, you know, to get the best price we can for our clients. Our other role as agents is to make sure that we're advising our clients properly um, and explaining to them that the property market 
it has declined in price and that they need to be realistic about their expectations. And that's not all bad because a, a significant proportion of people that are selling a property are moving upwards in the market. People are selling their two bed, they've had a child, they're going to a three bed. And this is the type of market where that actually can work quite well. So I'll give you a couple of figures. If, if you had a three bedroom house that was worth 515,000 um, a year ago, and you were moving to a five bedroom house that was worth 900,000, the difference you would need to make up is 385,000. So you'd need to find capital of 385,000 to make that move. After an 8% drop in the market, whilst your 515,000 pound house is only worth 474,000, so you're having to take a bit of a hit on what you're selling, that 900,000 pound house is now only worth 828. So what you're having to make up in terms of capital is 354 instead of 385. So it's actually 30,000 pound cheaper to move now if you're upsizing than it was a year ago. And that's an education piece that we obviously um, make sure that we're talking about to people in the market because um, it's quite easy to forget that or be blinded by the fact that you're, you're not getting quite the price you were hoping for or that you were getting from last year. So that's what's been going on in the market. In terms of Reading, Reading's really interesting. As I said at the beginning, you're building more houses in Reading than, than targeted. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's demand. You know, house, developers don't build houses unless there's a demand for them. Don't build flats unless there's a demand for them. Um, and we, it's not difficult to see why. It's huge investment going into Reading. It's a fantastic place to live. It's got great amenities. It's got great infrastructure. It's got fantastic travel um, uh, arrangements. It's got good schooling. It's got great leisure facilities, great eateries. It's close to a load of green open spaces. Um, it's easy to get to London. Um, there's, there's a long, long, long list of, of reasons that Reading's a really attractive place um, for developers to invest, and they continue to do so. Um, we're seeing um, commercial properties um, being uh, converted into residential properties. We're seeing the build to rent sector absolutely explode. So um, either commercial um, regeneration or from new, where people are building purely to rent out, because there's a huge demand for that. Um, and we're seeing a huge amount of first time buyers. I think Phil said on the invite for this, the Times have just um, announced that Reading's, um, uh, I think the top or in the top 10 places to buy as a first time buyer. Um, it's a great place to buy. And if it's a great place to buy, people will continue to invest here. Um, so you're bucking the trend in Reading um, on a number of levels, which is interesting. I think there's some, there is some pressures on commercial space at the moment. Um, um, there's, there's a lot of small retailers who are taking commercial space because a lot more people are starting businesses off the back of, off the back of COVID. But on big commercial space, I think there's, um, there's more companies who are embracing a hybrid working and remote working, um, which means that there's um, uh, less requirement for, for their huge headquarters or whatever it may be. Um, but there are a lot of people starting businesses and a lot of people succeeding in businesses. And, you know, it's networks like this that obviously help that. Um, what's happening next in the property market? Um, without getting out my crystal ball, I think it's safe to say that we're, we're in this interest rate environment for a while. We might see a reduction in rates, but it won't be a significant reduction in my opinion. Um, we're seeing five year fixed rates sitting under 5% at the moment in, in majority of cases, but two year fixed just over 5%. So we have seen a reduction in mortgage rates um, over the last six months. And I think we'll see probably a little bit more of a reduction, but nothing significant. I think we'll see a resilient property market. We're not gonna see um, a double digit rises uh, decline next year, um, because it's just, we, we, we all live and work in places that are too attractive to see that sort of, that sort of drop. Um, I think what we'll see is confidence come back to the market, get the election out of the way, and there'll be huge amounts of promises. I saw stamp duty cuts being banded around again. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see all sorts of promises, whether any of them actually come to fruition, who knows? But I think we've we, we've been in a resilient property market for a long time, and I, I can't see why that would change in the foreseeable future. Um, I hope that gives you a bit of an idea of, of what's going on in the market um, and, and what we're seeing. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if there's any questions. I, I hope that was kind of what you were looking for, Phil, and I hope you're not too disappointed that I'm not Philip Brown from Savills. <laughs> well, honestly, Ben, 
when so I just just to give a heads up, I spoke to Ben literally four o'clock yesterday afternoon and said, "Would you mind being here this morning?" And I think you've absolutely nailed so much this morning. And I appreciate that you're opening Sandhurst office on Monday and you're doing the presentation. You're you're getting it all ready at the moment. So thank you, Ben. Um, have you put your details in the chat so people can get in touch with you? I will do now. Um, yeah, stick it. Well, I, I say I, I won't take questions because I know you do need to get on this one. You are kind of shoehorning us in to your very busy day. But thank you very much, Ben. Put your details in, and we'll get in touch. Thank you very pleasure. much. Nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, Sue. Wow, I told you that Ben was a great speaker, didn't I, Sue? Uh, would yes. you like thank to you, introduce us to the next speaker? Thank you. Yes, um, we've now got we're coming to martin ebbs who is an economic growth advisor martin has been working with us at reader looking at the issues that we've got in terms of specifically around empty office spaces some of the stuff that ben was talking about in the changing nature of who how people are working where they're working what's happening on the office market and other commercial property markets so martin can i hand over to you to pick up on some of the research that you've been looking at and I think really how we compare with other other like places. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Martin Ebbs. I'm a consultant in economic growth. And <clears throat> I've been working with Reader for the last um, uh, four or six months um, on looking at the case for a an inward investment strategy, um, <clears throat> the purpose of which is to address the threat of oversupply of offices if we can't get more occupiers into the big schemes in the town centres and the business parks. So I'm going to talk about the case for an investment strategy, but uh, within that, the competitive positioning of Reading uh, relative to the other locations that could steal the business. Now, to do that, I need to try to share the screen, uh, which I now see that... <laughs> The host has disabled participating participant screen sharing. So, so if it's possible to reverse oh, that, yeah, I've got some Jane, slides I'd you... like to show. Yes. Sorry? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sort, sort it out momentarily. How? Thank you, Dave. So Dave's just sorting that out, Martin, if you want to. Yeah. It, should be, it should be working now. Yes, in the meantime. Okay. Can everyone see yeah. um, a heading that says um, yes, that's really inward investment fine. strategy for Reading? Okay. It goes. Well, what is inward investment? Basically, it's the attraction of investment and new employers into a location such as Reading. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is a step change in levels of demand for office and other commercial space in the town. Um, and to do that by attracting robust, globally competitive and knowledge-based businesses with good growth prospects, which would generate high quality jobs and self-advancement opportunities for local people, who in turn will spend their money and support a thriving retail, hospitality and culture-rich economy that will then help Reading evolve into a national, internationally recognised smart and sustainable city with a high quality of life and equal opportunities for all. So there's not just commercial considerations here there's more uh general sort of social benefits that we're trying to achieve as a result of this but the thing is is reading really sort of in a position to uh, compete for um inward investment from other parts of london and the southeast well we'd say it is and for a number of reasons on the left of this chart here you'll see a list of locations which we think are the main competitors for Reading. It doesn't include Canary Wharf, Croydon, and those more sort of the places on the other side of, of London, but areas that either compete because of particular sectors, such as in case of Oxford and Cambridge, or because they are basically in the to the west of, of London, south and west, I should say, really. And what you see in this chart is the amount of um, if we take the main sectors that occupy offices like, you know, professional services, business services, um, various types of consultancy, etc., 
um, and R and D. Um, we've quantified the amount of employment in those sectors as of 2021, which was the at the time the latest available data. And you'll see the figures that are in red represent the the big players that compete with um, Reading outside London, and that they have numbers in the sort of in mainly in the fifty thousands. So that's Hammersmith and Fulham, Hill, Hillingdon, West London generally, and Milton Keynes. But you'll see at the top that Reading is now employing about 54,000 people in office functions. Now, if you actually look on the right-hand column and you look down the page, with the exception of Cambridge, which attracted, th this shows the change in employment, okay, that Cambridge increased its employment by, office employed by about 6,000 people, mainly in R&D functions. The only other um, place that increased uh, was Basingstoke and Dean by about 600. And Reading, which increased their office employment by 1,200, sorry, 12,500 people, with all the other locations losing office employment. So Reading's obviously doing something right to attract those people. So let's have a look at other reasons why companies that are footloose might want to come to Reading. Um, first of all, in terms of scale and success, apart from Cambridge, which again is, um, is uh, R&D or, or orientated, uh, the office take up in 2021 um, put Reading and Hammersmith and Chiswick in West London more or less on par and exceeding any of these other competing locations. So basically prominence and, and you know, sort of desirability are, a key factor. Um, and then if one then looks at uh, what the accountants would be interested in, um, they tend to have a pretty influential uh, role in these matters. Um, Reading's rents are much lower than West London, Oxford or Cambridge, and other certain uh, locations in their own counties. And as regards the rest of the Thames Valley, basically on par, uh, unless you count the Blackwater Valley, which has not got very good infrastructure. Um, so Reading competes very well on a um, cost basis in terms of primary rents. In terms of availability, Reading has um, over 2 million square feet of office readily available. Um, again, on par with Hammersmith and Chiswick. Um, but you'll see that Cambridge, its availability has gone down. So um, for people who want to move in the short term, this is a big advantage for Reading. Again, talking about costs, this chart shows the um, average weekly earnings of people by place of work. In other words, what employers are paying people as opposed to residents, what they earn by going up to the city or area or whatever. And you'll see here again, Reading has amongst the lowest uh, wage rates within this whole sub-region. The exceptions of places like Bas Basingstoke and Dean, South Oxfordshire and Wokingham, the latter two being relatively small scale um, in terms of, you know, office locations, uh, but certainly much cheaper than Bracknell, which is one of its nearest competitors, and um, Hammersmith and Fulham again. So basically on, on wage costs, Reading has a big advantage. Um, the same is true of house prices. Apart from Swindon, Reading is cheaper in terms of average house prices than any other competing location. Now, this is this is going to blow your mind a bit, but just to simplify, along the top of this chart, you'll see different types of occupational categories. And down the left-hand side, you'll see the list of competing locations. And in each of those, relative to each location, you'll see the number of people who live in that location in any one of the occupational categories. Now, in terms of skills availability, the important thing is this. In terms of professional and associate, professional and technical, 
um, occupations. Reading has has um, more than most other locations, but all of these different locations here, provided someone can get, get to a railway station in their area, uh, they're all accessible within um, 45 minutes by public transport, basically, traveling to Reading. So Reading has, with its accessibility um, advantages and recent enhancements with, with the, um, the Elizabeth line, a massive labor market available to it, which is a huge um, benefit uh, to potential inward moving companies. In terms of sectors, if you look down the left side of this chart, you'll see different types of sectors. And then how many employees, have, what has been increased employment in each sector in Reading uh, in the five years to 2021? And you'll see it's ranking in terms of, you know, how, how many employees, the level of employment uh, attracted. And you'll see that Reading actually beats all of the other um, locations, apart from in um, employment activities, um, scientific R&D and uh, real estate activities. So things like head offices, uh, in, you know, IT, advertising, uh, all the professional services, Reading is coming number one. Um, and with this thing about scientific R&D, it has come third, but it's come third after Oxford and Cambridge. So it's done very well to actually attract that number of people into that sector. So we have a number of competitive advantages to sell, highest growth in office employment, favourable office rents, high office availability, large labour pool, lower workplace earnings um, and house prices than the other locations. Um, it has the highest concentration of computer programming and consultancy staff amongst all the locations and the third highest growth in scientific R&D. It's got a lot to shout about. So um, just a few things in the commercial market that we picked up. Things are changing. This research was done sort of around the springtime this year. And then basically um, there are clear patterns of demand uh, for reading in recent years, mainly IT, um, life sciences, insurance, and uh, oil and gas and related engineering and finance and business services. Um, in some of the competitors, the, 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 the supply is declining. Bracknell's decline has declined by uh, of offices. This is by the way by twenty five percent. Milton Keynes is getting short of grade A space. Uh, Cambridge has done so well that it's now short of R&D space. But one threat is the fact that Hammersmith is likely to get oversupply, so that could mean them reducing their rents, which would then be a competitive issue for Reading. But do remember that staff will be more expensive in Hammersmith than they are in Reading. Um, there's a steady growth for grade A offices and amenity-rich space, because if you want to attract uh, decent employees, you've now got to have that. And any offices that don't, probably won't remain as office buildings for very long because people don't want them. It's either going to be high quality or nothing. Um, there has been slow letting activity due to um, uncertainty about what's happening with, um, you know, working from home and uh, inflation and, and so on. But there are uh, noises that suggest that there'll be a very strong move towards employees demanding offices coming uh, um, people coming back to the office five days a week, very shortly. Um, the deals are getting smaller at the moment, although that could change, um, mainly because of this sort of hybrid e effect and lower demand for office space. Um, most of the uh, inquiries for space are coming from within the greater area, but there is evidence of um, demand being sucked in from um, less... Um, well-organized locations like Guildford, Slough and Camberley, which haven't modernized their um, business parks or been able to take advantage of, you know, uh, taking new development sites forward. Um, 
but, uh, but there is a wide market catchment um, in, really from London right through the Thames Valley, Surrey, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire and parts of Hampshire. So what are the activities that Reading should seek to attract? Well, first will be company HQ operations. It's done well in that in recent years, <clears throat> but it has underperformed over the long term compared with places like Milton Keynes, um, even Bracknell and West London. Technology businesses, particularly in um, computing, are um, uh, a big factor here. We have Microsoft. We have the biggest concentration of computer prank programming. Um, there's good potential there. Uh, if we can supply the laboratory space, which there is scope to do, um, we can maybe capitalise on the sh impending shortages of lab space in Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> Reading is already attracting most and highest number of professional and high-value business services. Um, we have major studio development where there's scope to begin uh, marketing area to film uh, TV production and high-value media and associated uh, supply chains. The insurance industry in particular is rearing its head um, in terms of demand for Reading. And if we're going to get sort of public sector agencies or maybe some NGOs, they tend to involve very large workforces, in, you know, in sort of several hundred upwards. So those are the sort of targets that Reading will want to attract in an inward investment strategy. Um, what is the focus? We're trying to attract people in the town centre offices and the major business parks and R&D space in the wider greater Reading area and the film and TV sector and supply chains. Um, and we're trying to, uh, the aim is to attract that from this rugby ball which goes from central and west London um, westward through the urban areas of Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and Surrey, west to Swindon, and then north and south to South Oxfordshire and down through the M3 corridor. So that's what we will be looking for. And basically <clears throat> putting effort into um, relocations involving 25 or more employees, but hopefully others of maybe 100 employees or, or more. So basically, um, we have a lot of strengths to um, promote in terms of choice, commercial property, costs, um, accessibility to the labour market, accessibility more generally, uh, good business networks and uh, collaboration opportunities, um, investment opportunities for more development and you know, a fairly ambitious uh, local authority that has got a rather robust uh, vision for Reading. So what do we need to do? Well, the first thing we have to do is get a formal partnership. Um, it's got clear objectives and resource commitments. That process is already starting. Our readers board is assembling a grouping of um, developers who are going to be approached for um, a participation in this whole initiative, but it will involve them um, you know, helping to fund it as well um, in partnership with reader who are putting a lot of resources in. Um, work is already underway on uh, developing a marketing strategy, which is a fairly sophisticated process. It's not like marketing baked beans. It goes much further than that. <laughs> you not only have to identify the decision makers, you have to you have to market to their advisors, people like you know property agents, their accountants, lawyers. And also within the companies, HR directors are now becoming very um, influential in locational choice as well. Um, then once we've got that in place, we will then have a uh, intensive marketing program where we publicize Reading's competitive advantages, successes and benefits to people who want to move to the area. Then we'll have tailored marketing propositions for different sectors. We'll have a very effective client management and conversion mechanisms. In other words, people who take the inquiries, um, interrogate the company about exactly what they need, give them a very detailed report about um, what Reading has to offer and hold their hand until the day they decide to move to Reading and then for the next three to six months while they're in bed. In parallel, there'll be a need to for the local authority to keep bring forward and uh, publicise planned improvements to the town centre. You know, for example, with there's plans for uh, mass ra rapid transit systems, which will be a huge boost um, in, a, in attracting companies, 
but also things like improving the cultural scene um, so that you have a stronger appeal to a younger workforce. <clears throat> um, in parallel, bringing the sites forward for attracting the film TV production supply chains and for things like scientific R&D and also things that will help uh, the companies to get up and running and make money uh, quickly once they move to Reading, in particular, recruiting staff and um, getting the necessary uh, introductions to, you know, potential collaborators and um, uh, supply chains. So, Martin, that, you know, Martin, I'm, is... Martin I'm, I'm sorry, Have you, we're running, we're really short of time now. I was just. My I didn't have many more slides that's... you had. I'm awfully sorry to interrupt you. No, that's all right. I was just saying that is it for now. So, if there's Brilliant. any questions, I'll be happy to, to uh, field them. Uh, Thank you so much, Martin. That was really interesting. Martin, that was fabulous. Thank you very much for that. Very insightful. I, I don't think any of us uh, knew any, pretty much any of that information that you've just shared very openly and very generously this morning with us. Um, we can we come back to you, Martin, if there's any time at the end of the meeting, if there's any questions. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Sue, would you like to introduce uh, Trina to us, please? Yes, yes. Thank, uh, thank you, Martin. Excellent. Um, and Trine. Oh, Hi. Martin's screen still, are we? No, we're there. Trine, no, it's just me. Trine, uh, sorry, coming to you now. Um, many of you will know Trine, who is the MD at House of Fisher one of Reading's um, longest standing um, disruptor companies in terms of accommodation, I'd say. And she's going to talk to us about what's happening in her part of the commercial property world. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I have big shoes to fill. Ben and Martin were very good. They gave a lot of insight information. Um, I hope I can give some information. I have put some slides together, uh, which I will try to share here. Um, so yes, very welcome uh, to House of Fisher. We are a service departments provider um, in, across the Thames Valley. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. Um, You've gone to the end. No. <laughs> get back to the beginning to of your slide show. Let's try this again. Amazing. Well done. Okay, so we start again. Yes, House of Fisher, um, welcome. Um, as mentioned, my name is Trina Ostergaard Stafford and I'm the Managing Director. Quick overview, our parent company is TA Fisher, who is a local property um, developer with 125 years experience. We are one of the, one, the largest owner operator of service departments in the UK. We operate nine properties across the Thames Valley to approximately 200 apartments across seven town locations. We have two properties in Reading, which is 100 Kings Road and City Wall House, which is a total of 81 units, ranging from studios up to three bedroom apartments. We are very actively uh, involved with both Reading Bid and Reda. Um, just explaining a little bit about service departments, we are members of an association called ASAP, the Association of Service Departments Providers, which represent professional and ethical operators. Um, which is very important in today's market as there are a lot of unregulated short-let apartments out there, um, uh, the whole Airbnb market, for example. Um, we have held an ASAP accreditation, an industry accreditation based on health and safety compliance for over nine years. Um, a service department generally is sold on a short-term basis and that can be for more one night on a daily rate plus the VAT that starts at 20% and is then reduced to 4% after 28 nights consecutive stay. Service departments offer a service clean after every seven nights. Uh, otherwise the apartments uh, are self-contained, but obviously the support services from for example, 24 hour guest services and emergency maintenance. There are no legal contractor agreement between the guests and us like an AST. Uh, we work very much like hotels. It's a standard booking confirmation with T's and C's and cancellation terms. Reading after the pandemic, um, both Martin and Ben talked about this as well. Um, there were changes in our industry as well. We now 
uh, only offer two nights plus stays due to the extra cost of cleaning and staff in general. Uh, our length of stay generally for Reading is about seven nights. We have a lot of long stays, but we also have a lot of weekly stays. After the pandemic, we saw a shift from the two beds sharers um, to the one bed uh, with home working facilities. We also found that Trends and Traveller was bringing the whole family in many cases and all of a sudden saw a demand for larger apartments as they were bringing children. Uh, corporate travellers were also staying longer instead of shorter, multiple stays. We saw that there are longer stays, probably due to cost of flights um, and also perhaps restrictions around the green policy and sustainability policy within the companies. Sustainability has become a big focus for many corporate companies. Um, we believe it's kind of overtaken the health and safety compliance element. Hybrid working, uh, which uh, Martin touched on as well, along with online uh, meetings like today, are still affecting us a lot. Um, Reading Town Centre can be fairly empty on certain days, and, and we definitely feel it. Reading remains strong around big events um, like the Reading Festival, Freshers Week at University, Royal Ascot, etc. We've had a very strong summer around events. Um, working with us, um, we work um, with a large number of corporates working in Reading and coming into Reading for projects. We attract also leisure guests for events, university um, and holidays. Um, just to give an example, we are, work very much like a hotel. We work, uh, we sell on Booking.com, Expedia, uh, through agents, um, but also through our own teams and website. We have seen um, a lot of people trying to cut out the middleman and the agents to get better prices um, and are booking directly with us uh, where live availability and a great website has been a key um, to that business. We heavily promote uh, Reading through blogs, LinkedIn, social media, and we have a monthly newsletter that now goes out to about uh, nearly 10,000 people. Our guest profile really includes corporate companies, but also insurance uh, claims, relocations, project workers, stays for refurb work or people in between moves, local councils, film studios, et cetera. Um, the future for Reading, obviously I would love to have a crystal ball and the others brought up some, some great um, facts. Um, these are sort of things that we hear of. Um, Reading is now considered very affordable compared to London. And Martin kind of mentioned as well, the Elizabeth line has made a great uh, connection between the two. You can live in Reading and work in London. We have corporates that work in Paddington, on a hybrid basis uh, and are living in Reading. Traffic for Reading um, is an ongoing problem. Uh, getting in and out is a nightmare um, and it's making the location, I think, less attractive uh, and parking is a strong USB. Um, but we definitely have corporate clients that um, don't want to stay in Reading because of the, the hassle with traffic and the extended travel. Um, and that's obviously uh, considered people coming in cars. Um, there's about five big apart service apartment providers in town now. There's more hotel brands coming in. Um, the local market can be pretty tough due to the corporate clients uh, budget constraints and the inconsistency in demand. Um, and it's most likely down to hybrid working and the train connections that people can leave at the end of the day. Uh, but we're finding a uh, majority of the uh, companies still working hybrid, uh, which is affecting us. Uh, we expect the BTR buildings, which are popping up everywhere in Reading, to become another competitor of ours. Um, we do believe they're going to offer short stays um, if struggling to fill their units or to uh, yield their rents. Um, many of them are very upmarket for the area uh, and only affordable for some, uh, which will be our corporate clients. We also expect various markets, the ASTs, the service, the BTR, to become very blended um, and only sort of different standards or different USBs or perhaps price will set them apart um, until the government uh, finally puts in some regulations and restrictions around the planning use. Um, I just wanted to highlight our website. Um, if you wanted information about us, everything is on there. All our locations, as I said, we cover seven town locations, all our policies. We have a great sustainability page uh, and we have some great news blogs around Reading uh, and the local area. We'll also see we have a half term offer there if anyone wants to come and stay until the 3rd of November. And we will also have a Christmas offer soon. Um, just covering what actually House of Fisheries, our service departments are fully furnished. 
uh, water dryers, we've Sky TV, we have bathroom per bedroom. So if you have a two bed, it's two bathrooms. We have 24 hour support, both in emergency and guest services. Um, Hunter Kings Road is fully air conditioned. We have our other property, City Wall House, is partly air conditioned. We have a co working uh, lounge over Kings Road and a terrace. Uh, parking is available at Kings Road along with the bus gym. I thought that was sort of uh, a little summary and, and things that might be related to today's meeting. But if anyone has any questions, please do ask. Again, thank you very much, uh, Trina, for a, a very comprehensive introduction to House of oh, Fisher. Um, we will see if there is any time at the end for questions, but we still have a couple of things we need to get through. So thank you very much. Please hang on there and we'll come back at the end if, if we can. Um, Sue, yes. did you want to do your summary of what's happening in Reading first? Um, uh, I'm just thinking if if there's, I think probably go to Martin. Are we going to catch up on the next meeting in a few minutes? So we can just talk yes. about what's been happening. That, that. Because obviously we need to talk about the follow up to our massive supply chain event. Um, which took place on the 4th of October. And was really okay, uh, Martin Anderson has asked for uh, a couple <laughs> of minutes, Martin, um, to introduce something. So feel free. Uh, if I'm afraid, Martin, if you go over three or four minutes, we will be cutting you short because it's time you see this morning oh, sorry, is Martin. massively tight. No worries. Uh, no worries. But, come on, Martin, tell us tell us why you want to speak very, to the wedding bit, business. Very network. exciting project. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I'm going to see if I can share the screen just because it'll make it a little bit um, quicker and easier. Let me know if you can see this. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Dersen. I'm a management coach based in Maidenhead, but I'm also a student at Henry Business School uh, doing a master's in coaching behavioral change. It's research project time uh, dissertation, which means that I'm looking for connections. Uh, sorry, for connections to uh, business owners of small, medium-sized companies uh, for research on energizing leadership or contagious in, uh, leadership and the impact that can have on employee engagement, motivation, and, and ultimately performance of uh, the team of the company. So um, why is this important? Well, you, you'll know this better than me, but staying agile, pivoting to opportunities, bouncing back and maintaining an entrepreneurial spirit, the key ingredients for success. And as leaders, we are the, the number one energizer for a team. So what we say, what we do affect how our teams feel and behaves and ultimately how, um, so this moves a little bit too quickly. Uh, and, and so ultimately direct, uh, directly links to the, uh, to the success of our company. So understanding what drives that engagement is critical for uh, us as business, business leaders. Um, so if you're curious about driving engagement, motivation, if you run your own company, if you've got between four uh, to up to a hundred employees, then I'd really, really love to hear from you. Um, if you participate, uh, you'll get a couple of things uh, in for free. So there'll be a tailored report with key findings. Uh, if you've got five or more employees to participate, I can extract the results for your company specifically. And there'll be an online workshop for business owners on contagious leadership with tips and tricks that will allow you to boost your leadership skills and also unlock uh, the potential of your employees. All you've got to do is participate in an online questionnaire. Um, there's one for the business owner, different one to the employees. It'll take 10 minutes. All results are anonymized. They run in connection with the Henry Business School. And the data collection is here in November 23 with results in quarter one twenty four. So if you're a business owner, if you know someone who uh, is interested in participating, uh, please send them my way. The more who join up, the better the results will be. I'm going to post a, a deck in the, in the chat uh, together with uh, my contact details. Thank you very much. Well done, Martin. That's well it. done. Three minutes, didn't it? That was brilliant and very short, which is appreciated today. Um, Sue, can I throw back to you then for um, follow up to the, uh, the yes. last meeting and uh, thoughts on what's going on in Reading? OK, so um, lots going on in Reading at the moment. Nothing seems to be standing still. Um, there is a lot going on in terms of development, and I'm sure most of you some of which we've touched on today in terms of things like build to rent and the pressures that build to rent blocks are bringing, you know, that there's demand for more accommodation for people, for places to live. Do we need lots of flats? Is that what we need? Or do we need more family accommodation being built is a question. Um, but certainly in terms of the commercial market, the 
project that Martin was talking about and the research that he's developed to back that project is about getting more companies into the grade A office space that we have being built in Reading at the moment. Um, that is important for the whole of the town centre. doesn't take a rocket scientist to work that out, but the more people we get in the town centre, the more vibrant the town centre is, the better viability of the small businesses that are in the town centre, and indeed our big shops, the, the shops that are suffering because they don't get the footfall they used to see. So places even like John Lewis and Marks and Spencers will do very well from having more people working um, in the town centre. So that's the kind of work we're looking at at the moment, and that's against some really quite major development plans that have gone in for places like Baston Road, for um, some of you will have seen the proposals for major development on the furniture village um, area opposite the jail. So to go opposite Kennet Wharf, which has rapidly appeared up on the banks of the old Toys R Us site and home base site, they're now looking to put 12 more blocks on the space opposite there, which would, where that retail park is at the moment. So huge interest in Reading in terms of development. Um, and I think there are big issues in terms of how that's going to shape the town going forward, um, not least of which is pressures on infrastructure and transport, which Trin uh, touched on, because obviously the more places we build, the more places um, people are going to have to drive to, because not everyone wants to get on the train or get on a local bus as, as good as our transport infrastructure is. So those kinds of things are what's going on at the moment. Um, I was just thinking, and then on the back, the, the biggie in terms of commercial property on the edge of town, obviously Shinfield Studios. We're looking to do a follow-up event next month. So the next online event will be a follow-up to our supply chain event that we held on the 4th of October. That was such a great evening. For those of you who were there, I hope you got a lot out of it. I hope you enjoyed the networking evening. Um, we're now planning some follow-up to that to keep momentum moving. But this is about getting more and more of our companies linked into the supply chains of the production companies who are going to be using Shinfield Studios, as well as the new studios at Winash. And again, some of you will have seen that, um, I think they're called Studio 50 at Winash, are looking to expand their site as well. So they're looking to multiply the studio space that they have at Winash, which will bring lots more production companies in, which will create a lot more opportunity in terms of supply chains for everything from accommodation to logistics to cleaning to security as well as all the traditional film skills that we know you know go to make a movie so that's that's on the pipeline i hope you can join us at the next meeting we will share all the details of that um, which, which will be on the 30th ahead. of november 30th of november thank you so yeah, 30th of November for our follow-up to supply chain um, issues. Um, I just say it was a great evening. We had 120 people in the room. We had 180 actually sign up for the event. We've now got us contacts. Um, and the next meeting will be very much a what, what are the next steps? What do you need to do? What do you need to know that we haven't covered? So that's where we are with that. Um, and I think that's it from me. Um, just And just, I think, to share that, um, Martin, thank you so much for your patience um, and joining us, Martin Andreasen. We will share your details, because I think what you're doing project-wise is excellent. We'll share your details and see if we can get plenty of people signing up to your survey. Fantastic. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been thank, uh, thank fantastic to meet you tonight. Uh, today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. As you know, we like to try and keep the, uh, this to an hour. <clears throat> so um, for, forgive me for uh, rushing a little bit through the agenda, but I'm sure you will agree that we've had um, four very interesting people who've spoken this morning. A lot of opportunity to network and share your contacts. And uh, we'd like you to spread the word about Reading Business Network uh, and how people can get involved. Please sign up. Uh, Dave will kill me if I don't say, please, can you sign up? If you would like to see this again or any other things, have a look at the YouTube channel. So please sign up for the Reading Business Network YouTube channel. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. And now Dawn will uh, give us a quote to finish us off. Thank you very much.
Lovely, thank you. Um, so as Phil said, we do tend to end, end every meeting with a, a motivational quote to keep us going and get us started again. So today I've got, um, you have to set goals that are almost out of reach. If you set a goal that is attainable without much work or thought, you are stuck with something below your true talent and potential. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have an amazing end of October. Uh, Halloween, don't forget to trick or treats uh, in the next couple of days. So put loads of chocolates out for those young kiddies who are coming around and, and the older ones as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.